So without uh, further ado, I want to introduce our moderator. Monique uh, is, uh, I, I want to say thank you so much for moderating today. She's currently the office of the public policy manager at Facebook. Monique uh, works in public policy in Facebook, leading engagement to third party think tanks, advocacy organizations, and civil and human rights organizations. Prior to joining Facebook, she served in the Obama administration, mostly as a deputy chief of staff to senior advisor Valerie Jarrett for seven and a half years. Prior to this, she was a director of planning and public engagement at the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs where she planned international travel and strategic large engagements for former President Obama and former First Lady Michelle Obama. Um, I wanna say again, um, you know, just it means so much to me uh, when our agency worked, uh, started working in advocacy um, and, and working to change policy. Our biggest move into that was working with the Obama administration and working with people like Tubi and Monique. Uh, we work so closely with uh, the Office of Public Engagement to use our selection celebrities to mobilize initiatives that were really important to the Obama administration. And from there, it taught us so much on how to think strategically and to align and lift. So um, it just, the fact that we're all coming together in this Zoom room right now is a dream come true for me. Um, and for, without further ado, I'm going to ask Monique to take over and moderate this panel. Great to be here this evening. Tammy and Brittany, thank you for the thoughtful introductions, um, but also for organizing this incredible panel series. Um, Tammy, I'm consistently impressed by you. You're, you always have your finger on the pulse in terms of convening the conversations that need to happen. Um, with, with dynamic leaders. So this is no exception. Um, I think, you know, when we think about this moment in the whirlwind of hopes and anxieties and fears that many of us are dealing with during this period, um, from work to family, employment, um, it's really, really meaningful to have spaces like this where people can come together to not only discuss um, organizational, you know, governmental and private sector response to COVID-19, um, but also just to check in and see where everyone's at um, and to do that in community. I'm the deputy director of the Girls Opportunity Alliance, which is a program at the Obama Foundation championed by Michelle Obama. Um, prior to joining the foundation, I was at the White House serving as associate policy director to Mrs. Obama on her Let Girls Learn initiative. Um, and then prior to that, I was at the State Department working as an attorney on anti-discrimination, anti-harassment policies. Um, our work really focuses on ensuring that adolescent girls around the world, and particularly in low and middle income countries, have the ability to go to school and learn. Um, as you can imagine right now with all of the school closures because of COVID, the work that we're doing is more important than ever. There are about 1.5 billion children that are out of school right now. About 800 million of those are girls. Um, and and the, the initial studies coming out are just devastating in terms of the number of girls that will likely remain out of school even after this crisis. Um, our program focuses on investing in grassroots leaders and organizations that are based in these low and middle income countries who really understand the challenges that girls are going through. So things like child marriage, um, gender-based violence, uh, poverty, uh, girls just whose families can't pay their tuition fees. Um, and so we are investing in these organizations and leaders and making sure that they're equipped with the resources and the tools that they need to really help girls um, have access to education. We are also using our platform to mobilize and, and galvanize um, resources to support this issue more broadly. Um, and I'll jump into that a little bit more during the call. Um, in terms of why I do this work, it's deeply, deeply personal for me. So my family's from Ethiopia. Um, my parents came to the U.S. separately for uh, an education. And even right now, there's just so many girls in Ethiopia who don't have access to an education. And so I cannot even begin to imagine what my life would have been like if I grew up in Ethiopia. I don't think we can overemphasize um, the importance of civic engagement, voting specifically, also um, thinking about the census during this period. Patrice, in um, a video piece that you produced with Now This, you shared that we live in a society 
that has forgotten how to forgive. Incarceration is an experiment, and it is an experiment that has failed. You go on in this video to discuss the intersection of inter incarceration and mental health and your fight to improve the prison and mental health care systems. I would love for you to share with this group um, how COVID-19 has exasperated an already unjust and distressed system, um, as well as some of the work you're doing to sharpen focus on prison reform during this COVID-19 period. Patrice, I'll hand it over to you. Sure, um, thank you for that. And it was so amazing to listen to everybody um, just share where you're at, how you're doing, and also the work that you continue to do. Uh, I am um, a firm believer that um, the mental health, mental health crisis is um, an incredibly important endeavor for all of us to be a part of. We live in a nation that um, incarcerates, um, that criminalizes mental illness. And so if you look at any county jail, any state facility, any federal facility, um, you will find that often more than half of their population went in with some sort of mental health um, uh, crisis, um, whether it was severe mental illness, bipolar, schizophrenia, or PTSD, depression, general anxiety. Um, and with that, um, you will um, definitely come out with some sort of diagnosis after being in prison. So it's not as if prison at all rehabilitates people with mental illness. Um, in fact, it exacerbates it and um, creates mental illness. And so as someone who grew up in a community and a family um, with um, mental illness, and it wasn't something we talked about, it wasn't something that was um, clarified, I learned um, really quickly that what was happening in my neighborhood and, the, and my community was actually deeply impacting my family's ability to be not just physically well, but emotionally and mentally well. well. And so I've spent much of the last decade of my career focusing on health and wellness and spending time um, doing a deep dive into how incarceration has um, become the new um, mental health facilities. Here um, in Los Angeles, uh, we have the largest jailer in the world. Um, and it's also the largest mental health institution in the country. Um, Cook County's jail system is the largest mental health institution, Rikers Island, largest mental health institution. And so people probably ask, well, why? Why has that happened? Well, it's been um, a 50 year fight um, and it's been a 50 year divestment out of the um, uh, healthcare system. Um, so we've divested out of the, the mental health care system and we've spent all of our money. And when I say me, we, I don't just mean um, people who uh, are lawmakers. I mean, every single one of us have bought into this idea that people with mental illness, uh, especially people with severe mental illness, deserve to be criminalized. Um, some of the first, you know, media images, if you think of someone with schizophrenia or bipolar disorders, you think violence. And in fact, that is quite the opposite. And so part of our work, um, the work that I've done is to destigmatize mental illness in our communities, especially in uh, communities of color, but also to um, remind us that we need to reimagine what public safety actually looks like, reimagine what it means for people, people to be well, and that we've invested all of our imagination into um, believing that a jail cell and a, and a gun and a badge is actually what keeps people safe, when in fact it's the opposite. People having access to jobs, people having access to shelter and homes, people having access to an adequate education, people having access to mental health care and physical health care, that's actually what keeps us safe. Not just the individual receiving the care, but the community that that person lives in. And so that has been a, a really critical place for me and conversation and tomorrow, uh, is the first day of Mental Health Awareness Month. And so um, I would really encourage not just the panelists, the people that are listening in, to check out on your loved ones this time even more, especially the loved ones who do suffer from depression, anxiety, mental illness. This is a, a incredibly hard for the community that is imp impacted by men mental illness. And um, we have the opportunity to talk about it every day, but especially in our organizations, explore what that looks like during the month of May. 
now that I have time to breathe and sit back and I just look through like emails that I've missed, um, it's really interesting that everyone wants to take their part and like, how can they show up in the world? As I mentioned before, talent, art, the artist community, they're really, you know, they recognize their privilege and they're so hungry and thirsty to like, just make a change and how do they break this down to their audience you know their fan base range how and that's what's unique about our platform we incentivize uh global citizens from around the world to take action to call on world leaders and you know you know 13 year olds can now learn about what is the world health organization you know because their favorite band is following global citizen they performed and they're explaining to them guys this is what i this is the cause that i'm championing i'm championing and I want you to take action as well. And here's what it is. So it was, be it's beautiful. I mean, I've always thought that the work that we've done was amazing, but to see this at a time where the world is at standstill and to see the artists really come together and the way their fans have been engaged. I mean, from March 13th to April 22nd, we've had 496,000 people take action. And our consumer base is from 13 to 65. So people are really taking action. They want to know, like, no matter where you are in the world, how can you do your part? And it's not about money, you know, like, and I, and I think that's what's also great. It's like, we're not asking anyone to everyday individuals to use their own funds. It's take action. It's put, le put pressure on world leaders and corporations that have it, that can make change, you know, that can, you know, governments that can implement, as we talked about, as to be mentioned, Young girls are affected. They're out of school. We need to, no, there's no amount of dollars that's going to change that if it's not, if it's not changed within government. We can give, you know, we can, everyone can write a check, but if it's not changed on the government level, it's going to be hard to see a huge impact. So it's been, I mean, just blown away. And we, because we're, it's happening so quickly, we're just like, okay, so what's happening next? You know? Um, and we're getting ideas from managers just similar to Tammy and Brittany who come together and they're just like, hey, my artist, this is what we're thinking about. How can we incorporate this into our strategy? And what's good is that our, you know, my CEO, he's young, he's fresh, he's innovative. Um, he's a radical. Some days we're just like, wait, how? when he mentioned this, we we're like, how is this going to work? We like, what? And it came together. So now I can't wait to hear what 3.0 is. I'm, I'm nervous for my like, workload but at the end i know i'm going to be so excited to see the change and the, just the, co the community from corporates to governments come together to see this change happen you know to everyone to get involved i want to just say one incredible behind that just a quick little mm -hmm. study of how the way that global citizen had me as a pop culture expert navigate a uh, passion of my clients and we didn't have the overarching global strategy of, of how policy needed to be um, included in, in our goals. So when my client French Montana wanted to go to Uganda and make an impact, exactly what you said, I want to help the poverty issue. I want to give the village where these children have no shoes. I want to give them money. I want to build a library. I want to do these things. I, we didn't have the, we didn't have the on the ground expertise on how to navigate. So See, Amara, she mobilized within 24 hours, identified a local advocacy group that was already vetted by Global, that was in their network. We were able to partner with them. They had already had a foundation on the ground and a, and a, and a representative who actually met him at the airport. And we literally went and shot a film. You guys can, you can, someone can put a link to the film. I think it's on Vice. A 19 minute documentary of how he went and saw the poverty and saw the needs in education and healthcare on the ground, took him to, took him to the hospital. He decided when he experienced that there was only able, they were only able to handle a few women at a time when the birthing crisis is, 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 is astronomical. Babies are being born on the side of the road. So Global was able to help, they were help, able to help us find our immediate urgency uh, of helping. That's incredible, incredible, incredible. I think that's actually a great segue um, to Tubi. We, we want to hear about your work. Um, one of the, my favorite quotes from the First Lady, or former First Lady, my forever First Lady, <laughs> is um, intellect knows no gender, possibility doesn't know race, it doesn't know religion. Um, you mentioned that over 98 million adolescent girls around the world are not in school. It's even more exacerbated during this period. 
Can you talk to us about how your team at the Obama Foundation is approaching education broadly, um, but specifically during the COVID-19 period? Um, and we're also curious if there's any educational trends or breakthroughs that you're seeing that we should be collectively paying attention to. Yeah, thank you so much, Modi. So at the Obama Foundation, um, we're really focused on inspiring, empowering, and connecting leaders around the world who are transforming their communities. And so, as I mentioned earlier, we're doing that for grassroots girls education leaders. We're investing in their work. We're helping to build their capacities to help them strengthen and scale their organizations. Um, and part of what we've done is launched a crowdfunding platform where we're able to help drive funding to their organizations and also um, help raise awareness about the work that they're doing. Um, we've also created an online community where these grassroots leaders can connect with one another, exchange best practices, talk about the challenges that they're facing in their work, um, and then also access resources and tools that we're sharing. Um, and then more broadly, again, we're, we're doing a ton to raise awareness. We're using our platform, we're using Mrs. Obama's megaphone um, to raise awareness about girls' education and the need to invest in girls. Um, and we're doing this in a number of creative ways. So storytelling, um, most recently we traveled to Vietnam in December with Mrs. Obama, Julia Roberts, and a couple of other influencers um, to visit a school and to meet with young women and to really amplify the voices of the leaders um, who are supporting the girls. I am going to pivot over to Crystal. Crystal, you are based in New York, um, one of the epicenters of the pandemic in the U.S., um, and you, you lead work on advocacy topics like voting rights, education reform, um, and you really work across a number of sectors, television, documentary, print. Um, we are curious for your thoughts around this conversation around reigniting the economy. Um, so economic stimulus versus safety. Um, how, how should we, how are you thinking about this and how should we be thinking about striking that balance um, around economy versus health during this period? You know, I think the, the quagmire, uh, as you identified, is um, how do we reignite the economy and at the same time, um, ensure that we're doing it in a way that's responsible and safe and making sure that um, uh, we're not putting ourselves in a situation where we're going to have a second wave of um, the uh, COVID virus impact um, populations that, that haven't been hit. I mean, if you look at the 1918 um, flu pandemic in the United States, you see that states that came back too soon, um, although they had flattened with their cases, they, you know, went, the numbers arose, and oftentimes that second impact was worse than the first. Um, and so I think what's critical here is understanding that we're not going to be able to reinvigorate the economy if people are still being infected at a rate that is overwhelming the um, medical professionals. And that's really the issue. I mean, we've heard a lot of um, people say, well, um, when you look at the percentages of, of deaths, which there's still so much that we do not know about what the actual mortality rate is. I mean, you know, depending upon what network you listen to and who you're listening to, I think we've all probably heard anywhere between it's more than the flu, it's more than influenza A and influenza B, but we've heard anywhere from 2% to 5%. But the issue is there's just so much that we do not know. Please, Moni, yes. Can you answer one of these questions? Because you've been doing such a tremendous job moderating, but I want to hear what you have to say about something. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Let's pick a question. Let's pick a question. Um, has the pandemic negatively or positively impacted your ability to work? Um, I think first I'll say... Uh, you know, people ask me how I'm doing, and my automatic response is that I just feel grateful to be healthy. Um, I have asthma. My entire family has asthma. 
Um, as Crystal shared, I mean, we all know that this pandemic is hitting, hitting certain communities, um, specifically Black and Latinx um, communities, um, harder than others. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of fear, right? Um, I think in addition to being healthy, I feel tremendously grateful that I have a job where I am able to work from home. Um, I think, you know, we're constantly hearing about social distancing. I think the conversation needs to add a layer, and Patrice was saying this, social distancing is a privilege, right? There's so many um, race and, and class layers on top of the ability to social distance. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm fine at home. I, you know, have a setup. I'm working from my bedroom while my fiance works from our living room. And um, I, I think the, the good thing is that working at a tech company, I'd say about 80 to 90% of our communication was on VC to begin with. Um, a lot of our colleagues are based around the world. We're headquartered in California. So the digital transition was okay for me. I think um, the conversation about mental health is a real one. Um, I think when you're on, and I was reading about this, when you're on video all day, hour after hour after hour, there are just certain social cues that are different on video than you experience in person. And so a lot of people, there's added anxiety, you feel, um, you know, it's almost like it's very performative and it's, it's a different kind of mental and emotional drain. And so I think, I think a lot of people are experiencing um, that aspect of it. And then just, you know, day-to-day -day communication with my team is, is a little bit more challenging. We all have to communicate more. We're, we're constantly on um, channels like Slack and Messenger. Um, so I, I think there's just a, a piece around um, wanting to make sure that people feel comfortable and, and can feel like they're in community and, and making sure that folks don't feel isolated. Okay. Can I ask a question of Stephanie? Is that out of turn if I do that? No. We want this to be conversational, please. Yes. Uh, because I was just, I was thinking about this ever since you were, you were talking about it. And I know that, I know that you all at We All Vote have the best research in the world. And this is what I kept wondering. I want to know, what have you all discovered about that hundred million horrifying, sad, tragic number of people who were eligible to vote but did not vote in 2016. Um, if you put voter suppression aside for a moment, because that's its own issue um, that is problematic enough, but the bigger issue I imagine is the voter enthusiasm gap. Did you all find out any data around the groups that lacked enthusiasm around voting? And what was the largest sort of swath of individuals or data that you found of why people didn't go out and vote? Okay. Yeah, yeah so, it, so it varies, right? Um, what we found is that, um, I think one of the things I mentioned was that a lot of people are intimidated, mostly women. Um, they, they feel like they might not be equipped to make some of these hard decisions when it comes to picking the right person mm -hmm. to lead their city or the school board or whatever, right? So they're intimidated by the process because they feel like they don't have what it takes to make that decision um, or those decisions, plural. So there's a confidence factor. Um, and I'm talking about mostly women of color, but all women, it's, like, it's across the spectrum, all women. Um, and then uh, on the flip side, there's a lot of people who don't think voting matters. They don't see how it affects or impacts their lives. I do think that the blessing behind kind of where we are right now in this country, I think is a really good potential wake up call to see how every facet of government, of, uh, government actually affects your life. <laughs> Literally from your mayor to your governor, right, to the president, like everybody impacts your lives in a way that it was hard to kind of, I think, demonstrate to people. Also people, especially people of color and black people in particular, younger generations don't see the responsibility in voting. So just like you mentioned how, you know, our, our ancestors or families died to give us this opportunity and this right, they're disconnected from that. 
um, which is really sad and discouraging. And if anybody on this call has ever gone down to Montgomery, Alabama to um, yes, Brian Stevenson lynching memorial uh, that that um, Brian Stevenson did, like if you go to the wall that talks about the reasons why people were lynched, voting is probably sixty percent of the reason why. Like they try to vote, they try to register voters. So it's 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 actually it's sad that there's that that chasm or that disconnect between the younger generation. Um, of African American voters in particular, um, but people don't think voting is a responsibility overall. It, it's more like a choice. Uh, they view it as a choice. So a part of our job, uh, as we see it, is like, how do we convince people to make this choice? Just like someone's going to choose one soap over the other. And I know I'm like minimalizing it, but it actually kind of gets that a marketing campaign. <laughs> it is. It is. And like, if you think about it too, like, especially as a is going to affect your life. Yeah, and especially as a con content creator, like if you think about it, like every way this country has kind of moved the culture at large forward, uh, maybe for LGBTQ issues or, um, you know, ensuring that you don't uh, mark one race or one nationality as terrorist or something like that. Like there's consciousness that goes into how we tell stories, how we create movies, how we create narratives, right? But if you think about it, like social or civic engagement, especially voting, isn't a part of anything. You never see an episode of anything where people are waiting in line to vote, unless it's a movie about something, right? There was not one voting rights question in any of the debates for the 2016 yeah. election, so. We just, we just don't, it's like we don't talk about it, so. Um, it, that's a part of, I think, of the issue where people are just so disconnected from it. So yeah, there's, there's, I just don't feel confident to make these decisions. There's, I think this is a choice, not a responsibility. And then there's also people who just don't know how. It like, it, it alarmed me how many people thought they had to go to the DMV to register to vote. Like, we take for granted that we have this information, we get it, we know it. A lot of people just don't, that, the simplicity of like, you can go on a website in some places, most places, and register to vote, like that, that misses a lot of people. They don't even understand. So like, and then on top of that, like you do get all those messages of like, you know, like voter suppression, they're not gonna let you vote. Da, da, da. So like the whole process um, has become intimidating in a way and it's discouraged people from participating. Sure. And I think that too, certain groups have just felt disenfranchised year after year after year that they don't, they don't see the connection or the correlation. So it's incumbent upon all of us to really, to be that mouthpiece. And what we do know, because we have a star-studded uh, co-chair panel that supports Mrs. Obama's work from Tom Hanks to, uh, Janelle Monet to Trace Ellis Ross and Shonda Rhimes and all these amazing, wonderful people. At the end of the day, um, we try to remind folks is that you are the best voice for the people closest to you in your life. You are the most influential person. So it, it's really important that, uh, uh, that people have that peer-to-peer -peer interaction and they're talking to people closest to them and asking them, are you registered? Like, I can help you. I can walk you through this process. And so like, that's a big, that's a big thing that we're doing um, when it comes to our volunteers and our voting squad captains, which yeah. is like a, a special love team of volunteers that we'd love everybody on this call to be a part of, um, to really like help with the people closest to them because they're the most influential people in their lives. I feel like I've been greedy with your time. So I'm going to stop. I would no, love this was, to conversation later. Because this was actually perfect because you both hit on themes around civic engagement and how others can get involved. Um, and those were some of the final questions we got into the chat. Um, so big thank you to everyone for joining this call. Thank you for the incredible insights that you shared.